A kia ora mai koutou, uh, koutou e mā takitaki ana mai uh, ki tēnei wānanga i rungi tēnei ipurangi. Uh, he mihi kau atu ki a koutou nga kaiwaka haere, uh, mai i a hui a tangata kotahi, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā tatou katoa. Uh, ko wai e nei uh, nga waine e noho mai nei, uh, ko mātou e te hio nga paurungua, mai te whaka meninga uh, o te rungo a kai ngā iwi e toru ko te atiawa, ko raukawa ko tō rangatira. Engari, ko Shalei Maua te Davis a hau, he uri a hau, uh, mai te taha o tō koe nei pāpa, mai a wehi wehi tai atu ki a nga te huia. Uh, Whakawhiti atu uh, ki a te atiawa, ki a taranaki, uh, ki te taha o tō koe nei Waia, ingari he uri hoki tēnei no nga ati tuaranga tira tātou ki a kaitahu. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā tātou katoa. A tēnā koutou katoa, a kō ai au ko nga ati tuaranga tira te iwi ko Takapu Ahia te marae, ko Rangituhi me Whatirea nga maunga, ko Pania Solomon ahau. Kia ora. Kia ora koutou. Ko wai au. Ko nga te gaukua ki te tonga. Ko nga te tō rangatira. Ko nga te huia. Ko nga te tūkorehe nga iwi. Ko he mai mā kāki kwerumu. Ahau. Kia ora. It's an, okay, it's interesting. I, I, I'm going to say this um, straight up. We've known each other yeah. for, for many eons of time. So I need to kind of say that in the first instance. And we didn't, I don't think, realise that initially. But um, there are things that we are, we, we are doing together and we are made to do together which we realise when we look back through the whakapapa and mm. we look back through what we're doing, we have done this in the past and now we're also um, doing it now and, and into the future. So I just kind of want to say that, I, I, you know, these are, these are my whanaunga, but they're also, um, there's a soul connection that was always there yeah. that brought us together. Yeah. yeah. I agree. We were lined up. Yeah. Tupunas just put us in the right place. It, it, it began, well it began for me at home, yeah, so here in Ōtaki uh, with my mum and the nannies of that time. And you know, nothing is ever structured but actually everything is, in, is planned in the way that things na happen naturally. Um, and the rungoa that came through, and uh, I need to state, the rungoa kupu was never used, eh? It was just, I'll go get that. Uh, it's a kupa kupa, it's a kua and, and the nannies would, would do what they needed to do, but the, the kupu rungoa was never ever heard. I never heard that till later. But it, it, it began at home, and it was a natural process. You know, or for your grandmother making you cut some of that flax, get the root, and then she's boiling it and dishing it out to all the kids. You know, because it's going to um, clear the puku. They've all eaten green plums. It's, a, it's that kind of um, learning as a, as a young person and not knowing you've been trained. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember as a young child, you know, we getting sent over to Nanny and Kuro's, and it was my Kuro that, um, you know, used Rungo on us. So that was like how we first got introduced, but not really realising. And heating things up on the coal range, and, you know, slapping it on you. And um, and also how he always had a marakai. Mm -hmm. And that is a Rungo in itself, like to feed the Fano. And, you know, him being the cook at the marae, and my dad being the cook at the marae, that's a rongoa too, because he's like looking after the um, whānau and the manuhiri, so yeah, it's just there, it's part of who we are. Oh, mm. 
I want to kind of say intangibly, I, I realize, I've realised over time that my journey into Rungoa happened um, antenatally. It's really kind of an interesting realisation. I remember having a conversation as a, as a young person with my mum, asking her about these things that my queen did. And I says, oh, because I, I had a memory of it. And she says, how do you know that? And I just said, well, I just assumed I was there, right? And she said to me, no, Queen died in October, you were born in January. She wasn't here when you, when you were growing up as a baby, as a child. And so I remember having this um, epiphany moment that that Queen had been guiding me um, into this pathway. So she was a, what they called a Māori midwife in our community in Manukau. And so she birthed all the babies, but she didn't just birth all the babies, she also doctored everybody up. And people have that um, remembering of her. And she was the safe place to go to for the tamariki. So they would go and stay by her. Um, and so that's my first kind of remembering about what comes through your lines um, and knowing that kind of, you know, you, you might not feel like you've been nurtured into this space, but actually your life circumstances all lead you to the right path. And so for me, I had lots of childhood experiences. My, you know, my brothers used to go up, up into the paddocks to get my clay when I was a PP. So, you know, fed up on buha and things of the whenua. And so clay is a rungwa as well, um, that my dad fished from the, the awa and the moana. Um, and so, you know, grew up on that kind of staple kind, but also the tikanga around that. And so you might not think all of those things have a bearing on you, but actually when you look at your life and you look at the culmination of all the experiences that you've had, and they can be good, not so good, and really ugly, but actually this pathway of Rungwa is right there. It's right there and actually your life is the key. Your life experiences are the key. And you get to make those decisions um, knowing that you carry this whakapapa that actually predetermines that anyway. We are, you, you start. It started with um, the three of us going to a Titahi Bay Herbal Society meeting <laughs> and then realising, it was a really good meeting, it's then realising, hey, what's happening with the Rungwa and, and the Art Confederation? We knew by being there, that's us. Mm -hmm. So from that meeting, we um, got together, hey, hui'd, and then we thought, yeah, let's do. So we had our first... Art Confederation um, event uh, in Ōtaki, October 17th at, um, at my place, yeah, and then we had other people. And from there, it's been a huge, big journey, so I might pass that on. Yeah, um, 2017 was kind of the year we started, so Hamima's talked a little bit about the first time we gathered, and I think that's a really important uh, conversation to be had around the initiation and the wānanga that we had to commence this. So, you know, the three of us and many others have a whakapapa to this taonga tukuiho, to rongoa. But we didn't have a space which actually brought us all together. So we've all had various experiences, different ways of um, being grown into and into learning about rongoa Māori. Um, and you'll find out a little bit more about that later, but um, we just wanted to kind of bring all of the, that, those whare of learning, those whare wānanga together, um, under the, the umbrella or the ho of our three iwi um, in this region. And it was really important because even though we did this work and other of our tūpuna have done this work, um, there was never, never a space to kind of say, here we are, this is who we are, this is mm. what we do. 
and it just seemed the right time. So 2017 seemed to be the right time because there was a re-emergence um, of the importance of rongoa or whana and the importance of rongoa as, as a gift, an innate gift that a lot carry, um, but their desire to want to come together collectively um, to be supported, to be nurtured, um, to advance our view, our ways of practising rongoa here um, across our three iwi. So, so it was kind of, you know, we kind of had that conversation, but I, I you know, Tupuna always have, a, have an interesting way of, of presenting themselves um, before you to say, hey, it's time now, Mokopuna, to do this. And I think we realised when we got together, because we we're already doing this mahi and our whakapapa, mm. and it made sense to, um, you know, combine our mahi and do this work over, over our whenua. Mm. Mm. Because, you know, we've never felt the need to have to record what our values are because actually they're present in what we do. So I'm more around, like, a lot of the kind of mahi I do um, external to ourselves is I ask organisations to look at their moi moya and then the values that underpin it, right? Because in that um, drops out the behaviour or the tikanga. So I, I turn the model upside down and go, for us, what you see us doing demonstrates our values um, and it's the, that helps us to achieve our, our vision for our whānau. And so our vision is rongoa in every whānau home. And, and we're not limiting this to just our rohi. We mean everywhere with everyone. And so our dream for rongoa is that um, rongoa is normalised in everyone's home. Whatever that is, it's normalised. And so our dream for the babies is that they don't go, what's that, Mum? Or Nanny, what are you doing? It just is. It just is. It's a, it's a staple inside of every whānau home. So that's our vision. And so how do we, you know, what are our values around that? Well, the whānau values first. Eh? They're about um, honouring whānau, honouring whakapapa, uplifting our people um, so that they can reclaim and remember who they are, who they are, eh? this lineage of chiefs, this divine whakapapa from Atua. Because when they kind of they can they can hold that space for themselves. <sighs> Magic happens. Magic happens. Mm. I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of my my taranaki tanga because I think that's a, a good place to start. Um, again, I, I I remember as a child. Um, before we'd go home to Taranaki, Mum would always take us to the water. It was just kind of the ritual that we had to go home. And it was something that my grandfather had always instilled in us. And so she'd kind of go to the tap and she'd um, whaka iri ia, And we'd go home. We'd go home to Taranaki regularly. It was kind of like the surf highway kind of thing. Anyway, my understanding of those practices around the way it was actually about the restoration and protection in the first instance, but it was also um, used in our whānau practices around calming the situation, calming the individual, bringing peace and calmness to that, to that person and, and what was going on, on at that time. And that kind of leads me to what I learnt later in life. And so rongo a, for me, and from a Taranaki perspective, and we've kind of adopted that as, as our understanding of it too because in our practices it's very present across our iwi. Um, rongo is the atua of peace. You know, the atua of peace 
um, of those peaceful arts, so in terms of growing kai. And so when we think about um, the atuatanga inside of Romo, it brings us to, to a place where we have to kind of be to, to bring ourselves back to a place of balance, to understand that our, our peacefulness in our heart is really important. So Matua Tuhirangi Waikere Puru, he said this kōrero at a conference at Pariaka. So Romo is the atua um, of peace, balance and equilibrium. And uh, because our reo is vibrational, the A means the potential. It's the space of potentiality. And so he said, you know, the art and the science and the mahi of Romoa is the potentiality of Romo to realise that. So that's just, it's one whakaro, but I know these ladies have a whole lot of other corridor that, that they understand Romoa to be. Well, I was just thinking, because we live in Ōtaki, eh? we're so fortunate because we can go from the, um, the moana mm. to the maunga and every and the awa, the mm. number of um, rivers in between that, that lead this, this way or lead back down towards the moana. So just growing up in Ōtaki and having people who are um, around you, you know, who are aware of all, where all the underwater streams mm. are flowing, who that you innately know um, the rising of water because you feel it in, in your tinana and sometimes in your hinina way. And so this 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 is a, a mātauranga that is held with whānau mm. because of how our mukapuna are behaving in various ways. The way that the, um, mm. the, the northwest winds come across um, from, the, from the moana across our whenua and I was thinking of my um, the cousin Miki Rikihana, he says, all that northwest winds coming through, all the um, tamariki are up in the air and playing up because of uh, he knows that particular hoe is going through them and they're just wild. He says, and they want to jump out of the windows, they want to jump off the trees. <laughs> and, he says, and he says, he's had to take them. He says, never keep the children inside it. So he'd take them out and they'd go up the moanga up where he was at um, Pukekaraka go out there, then you take them to the river. And when I was talking to uh, my nephew's wife, um, Tiriata, she talks about that, how he would suddenly take them all out and they'd be out for the whole afternoon. So that's a practice of rungo uh, isn't it? Mm. And there's so many in our communities that, um, you know, people don't, well lots of whānau don't think they have rungo mm. in, their, in their lives, but they actually do. They know when to go to the awa. They, they know when to, to take that um, track up to the Tararuas. Because it's inherent in where you, where, where you live. And I imagine that's happening across the mutu. Okay? Except the, but the thing that happens is that because we're, it's so innate, and because it's a part of us, we don't actually have, we don't actually call you all about it. We think that kōrero belongs to other people who have done this particular mātauranga in these universities or these wānanga. It belongs, the scientists belongs in whānau. <laughs> they, it started there. Mm. The science of our people, the mātauranga of the whenua, mm. awa, moana, maunga. Kia ora. And living and being brought up in Takapuahia, which is you know quite a small community, but we're at the marae all the time. And so, you know, observing and listening to our kaumatua and the tikanga and kaua that's, you know, they're performing all the time mm. um, to keep us in balance and to keep us safe, um, you know, is rongoa. And, and they do that for, you know, all of us, um, you know, in our community. So, yeah, we, we think it's a natural thing. Um, we don't kind of um, think it's any different, if that makes sense. Can, can I yeah. add to that? Because mm. you've just sparked uh, um, probably our more recent corridor. So coming together as a collective, part of what happened for us was that we were able to sit together 
and wānanga together and realise actually all these strands link, all these strands connect. If we remained isolated and didn't bring our um, knowledge centres together, we probably wouldn't have kind of pieced together um, the historical place of Rungoa for our iwi. And I think that's really important because I think that's the shift. Um, we talk about the heke mairaru. So we talk about the, the journey from Kafia through Taranaki and down here um, by our tupuna in the 1820s. And those heke actually hold some prevalent and some key indicators um, of the rongoa that our tūpuna brought with them and the tikanga that they applied on that arduous journey south. And so we know we started with te heke tahu tahu ahi. Mm -hmm. And so we have a very strong kōrero, you can find it in our um, evidence uh, at the tribunal, around the role of our kuia. Um, who lit the fires to, to hold that space and to ward off um, the pursuit of, of, of Waikato. And so we utilise um, fire and um, the use of s uh, the smoke from the fire to cleanse and to release. And we take those from those um, stories of old as, as a way of informing the practice of, of the future. Um, and then the other kind of one we probably will touch on is that hekinga from Taranaki on Te Heke Tātara Moa, which is very clearly a, um, a rongoa rāko that is central. <coughs> it's a signature um, to our practice because um, one, right now, from a mental health perspective, and a mental well-being perspective, that plant has, from that time to this time, been used at times where, where stress and anxiety and other pressures um, have been placed upon our whānau. Pai? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, right. so I just kind of wanted to say that, that um, it, it was the coming together that supported us to kind of validate these various experiences that we've all had and to go, oh, right, this is actually um, the codes that our tūpuna have left us. Yeah. Um, and we just had to wānanga and be together to kind of work out what the codes meant. Yeah, we get very excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> we do. do. Yeah, we do. You're part of uh, Rongoa, you're actually like living a Rongoa life, um, which is where Te Taio is underpinned, you know, from Rongoa. So everything we do, we are always aware of the Taio, um, always giving back. Um, respecting and educating um, our whānau to be a more more aware as you know we live in this sort of society today and it's a chuck out you know it's a chuck out society um, so yeah living the life of Rua we need to be looking after Papa Tuanuku because if she's not looked after, look at climate change now, you know. You know, our um, rongoa isn't something that's just arrived on the scene. Mm. Um, it is steeped in our whakapapa. So that's the premise of it. And so um, our whakapapa, you know, acknowledges Te timatatanga, eh, the beginning of time. And so um, when we think about waka papa, it comes through, you know, te timatatanga, mai um, te kore te pō ki te waiau ki te ao marama. And so that in itself eh, is a, is a um, pattern 
that our, our old people have left us around Waka Papa that leads to our connections from Rangi to Papa and those atua that um, they gave birth to, na atua waini, na atua tani, balance. Right? Another kind of sign of balance. Um, and so our tikanga derives from there. Our tikanga derives from those pūrāko that was the mechanism to keep uh, our um, understanding of the world alive. And so we, you know, that's, that's the base to the moa. That's the base to our obligations and responsibilities to all of our atua. And um, what does that mean? It means that we have to actually come back to ourselves um, and acknowledge the sacred and divine relationships that we are required to uphold. Mm. And I think for me, that's what Rungwa does for me, is it's a discipline. Because Pan talked about the throwaway society mm. and the quick fix society. Um, and that's not, that's not born from our world view and from our world. It's something we've inherited over time with what's occurred to and for us. Um, and so I just want to kind of um, yeah, bring that balance back to the fact that uh, yeah, our relationship as kaitiaki of this, these taonga tukuiho um, already predetermines, already predetermines how this is for us in 2022 and beyond. It's just, you know, that, that, that's always been present. It's omnipresent, I suppose. Well, I really um, love what Pania and um, Shah have, have said because it brings it around to um, the human being mm -hmm. who is actually a vessel of Rungwa. Mm -hmm. right? we, we, because if, we, if we are whakapapa from those atua, to hear, then we are embodiment of Rungawa, of Papa Tuanaku, and all those Atua. Um, and so, it's it's a, and I'm just going to say, inherent, it's natural. That's how I feel about it now. That um, we we actually, and I'm going to use that interesting word, which I don't like, but we flow with those um, incoming and outgoing actions of our Atua. Eh? Because Shah talked about something interesting. Some of these experiences are not good, that are challenging. That's rungwa, because we have to overcome those, those challenges, eh? get past that threshold to a to new understanding, a new mātauranga. So if we are in tune with what is happening, and that's how I feel we should be, if this is how rungwa informs me, and hopefully it's a real challenge to inform my whānau. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> if we if we are in tune with Papa Tūnuku, we always have the resources mm. and the awareness of how to overcome these challenges which is facing us globally, and that's climate crisis. Eh? Mm. Um, now, uh, we need to be aware that Papa Tūnuku will survive anything that we throw at her, that mm. human beings are doing with pollution and all the other negative things they're doing. She will survive it and she will overcome it. It's her uh, mukupuna, which is us, mm. the youngest on the surf, that will, um, will, will be our demise if we don't mm. tune in. So we have these tools that we have. Is we have the most meke, karakia, taki taki, mm. that links us um, to our atua and to papa and to wanginui, and it links us. And I have this as indigenous as indigenous people we, are, we have talked to around the world, we know that we are the answer. Yes. We are the answer for survival of humanity. Okay. Not the um, our Pākehā whānau out there. They haven't got the answer because in some way that they have lost that connection. We know we are a relation. We're, we're whenua. We're whenua, we're maunga, we're awa, we're moana. Mm -hmm. We're that. So... Um, and it is our science 
who are going to um, save us. Yeah. And it's about our people coming back and understanding this. Yeah. So I kind of think about that, eh? What you've just said, it's uh, one of our relations, Maru, she said, made yeah. this whakatawaki, ma te rongo, koe ka rongo. So it's through your, you, you sensing or utilising all of your senses, koe na te rongo, not just with your ears, right? Ma te rongo, koe ka rongo that actually you will be um, able to respond eh, better in this lifetime, in this, in this time of ours. So mā te rongo koe karongo, what it, whatever it is that you sense, um, you will also see through those eyes. You know, it's not too long now we've seen how the climate is happening. Mm. It's not too long now where things may go belly up. Mm. But it's going to be Aotearoa, we're the last bastion. And and there's a and we know why that is, you know. And so I have this great fantasy, it's a brilliant one, that we will have this tip on the dome over us and whatever happens around the world, kayak we're we're, <laughs> we're here. Seriously. You know, 'cause that's the how we engage in and, and act with our um papatua nuka with Rangi. And I think right. we've had the practice run, which yeah. is what happened with COVID. Yeah, we've had the practice run. Like I've not not when it first arrived on our whenua, I felt the power of all the karakia that were being put out. So you know, one of the things I know we were doing our komats, we were doing our iwi, we were doing was sending out this protective um, karakia across our whenua as we do, because um, we want to protect our people and, and, and our way of being. And I remember feeling that very strongly, and so your protective dome's correct. Um, that's the power that we, we have inside of our ancient ways. I think Kaitiaki Tanga, um, in the first instance, is, is a personal journey. And I think, you know, you, you, we are Kaitiaki of, of many things. Um, and so I think there has to be a kind of a personal realization of that. What are you a Kaitiaki of? Um, because only when you kind of consider your role as a Kaitiaki and you understand the responsibilities of those can you then kind of expand it out um, to your whānau, to your hapu, and, and to your iwi. So it's a really, it starts here. Kaitiakitanga starts here and your personal contribution too. And, and for me, you know, I feel blessed that we, we were um, left this as a, as a taumata guiho from our tūpuna because it's a reminder, it's really a humbling reminder not to get too big for our boots because we are only the tainer in, in the whakapapa of things. And so um, that's what Kaitiaki Tanga does for me at an intimate level. Because you actually, unless you get your backyard sorted, you kind of don't go out there beyond, beyond your backyard until um, you've kind of sorted those things out. And I do see that often, is that people find it hard to clean up their backyard but that's actually going to bring you the best learnings the most um, long-standing change in your whānau um, and it's also going to build a strategy of resilience um, so I'm not, I'll just talk about kaitiaki, kaitiakitanga that at a personal level because I know these two will have a whole lot of other corridor. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, I totally agree with what Shah said there. Um, you know, everything that we've been brought up learning from our tūpuna is kaitiakitanga and how we portray it um, in the mahi that we do. Um, it's kaitiakitanga through the Rongo Collective. Um, I know as my role, I 
I'm out there trying to protect the whenua from council's um, ideas and mm. how they want to treat our raka and our whenua and so I'm kind of like waving our flag and yeah trying to be that kaitiaki of our tōkana mm. um, mm. yeah kia ora that's, that's mm, yeah. Love that. Um, so, with kaitiaki tanga, one of the key things that I have focused on is how um, how I might be kaitiaki for mukupuna, mm. and not necessarily my own mukupuna, mm. but um, you see mukupuna in in the around the Fano and, and in our community who who just need that. Um, extra smile and mihi, you know, um, because you can see that there's something going on. And I, I actually um, have a strong emphasis on always smiling at children. And it's just been in my in my mahi in, in the past where I've heard from um, adults who talk about that from their queer or from someone in their community, and that's kaitiakitanga. Um, the, the way that we also, us three and other people in our collective, the way that we are kaitiaki for other um, of our whānau who are in positions of leadership, you know, mm. we, and, and we'll go, hey, what are you up to? Because you, you're looking tired. Mm. Are you taking care of yourself? I might have something for you. So, you know, you have that, that, um, that view, you look around and you can see, what's going on here? And because, you know, you're related or you're just who you are and you just can't help yourself. Um, and I've never, ever been um, pushed back on that. I've always had, oh, thanks, what do you think? You know, people are, um, need to be cared for in our community, especially when they're in positions of doing money for for their rōpū, eh? for their whānau, for their iwi. And you see that and think, oh, what do you think? And I, I will discuss it with uh, Sean Pine. He says, hey, I've seen uh, that mm. kaimātua. What do you reckon? Keep a track of that uh, wahine. She's doing all that mahi um, down in the ministry. So we have that lens. And when we're teaching some of our tauira, we have a number of um, whānau in our collective. And they're still tauira. Is that... Um, it's like, hey, here's a lens that you may have now. Or open the, open your lens up. So first, yes, care for yourself because you can't do this mahi unless you're in, in a good position yourself. And then look around you. Who is a rumua for this kaupapa? What do they need? Yeah. So that's part of kaitiakitana that we do yeah. all the time, actually. <laughs> I think that's a really good um, segue, actually, Amaima, um, because... One of the um, titles people kind of bandy around, are oh, you a rumua practitioner? And so that's not from our world. That um, self-appointment isn't from our world. So we, um, the title, I suppose, or the um, association to a title that we give um, our whānau that do this mahi, that's kind of what it is, our whānau that do this mahi, uh, kaitiaki rumua. And, and that's kind of to ensure that um, for us, the first kind of important space to, to work out as someone doing this mahi is what you're a kaitiaki of. Um, where are your strengths and your natural abilities, those things that have come in the, at this lifetime, and then how you're going to kind of grow, develop and nurture that in a way that um, you can be this exemplar inside your whānau. Um, of this, which you've chosen to 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 be a kaitiaki of, or actually that they've chosen you to be the kaitiaki of, mm. and so I kind of think about kaitiaki tanga in terms of the Rongo collective. We we've set up the collective to ensure that our kaitiaki rongoa are embraced, supported, nurtured, advanced, and developed in a way that they um, are also grounded 
um, and uh, aware of their obligations and responsibilities mm. to give back because it's just not this this space of Rongoa has the potential um, to be at a tipping point where we always are on the take and and that's the challenge that's how we know it's not the war mm. when when it's an only a one-way kind of a, a, a revolving door um, we have to because of that papa connection uh, through Nga Atua, through Nga Tupuna it's always a mai and atu space for mm. moa so you know we kind of we also see um, you know things going up on Facebook selling Rongoa here, no papa to it, no kōrero to it, and in actual fact sometimes no modi in it. And so um, we we want to make sure that the space of the Rongoa Collective has these vital conversations regularly and ensures that we, we check ourselves in this um, environment that can be very seductive um, and very tempting for our whānau who are trying to actually, one, live, but also survive. So, you know, this the collective of ours enables us to have these real conversations about this. Some of the pressures and the um, struggles our kaitiaki have. So you can hear that when you, the particular question that you asked us is a whole huge whānanga. <laughs> Yeah, which which is a great question. Yeah, yeah because there's many the many levels mm -hmm. to that to that you know that question and to that capri. But just what Charlene was saying, because it's alerting us to the pol um, the politics of what's happening now eh, in mm -hmm. the Rongoa space, mm -hmm. and where we have been sitting there watching. And, and talking to our rōpū and talking amongst ourselves and positioning ourselves where we are kaitiaki for rongoa. Yeah. And um, like Sha said, um, you know, there's legislation now going out with the government and it's all about commodify the, the, the rākā, right? And it it's, has nothing to do with whakapapa, it has nothing to do with actually um, the kaitiaki of of that of these environments, mm -hmm. and so there's a battle on. It's been around a long time since. Oh, what's that thing you're going to talk about? Yeah, the suppression, oh, the talking the suppression. Act. It's been around a long time, and all, although that's been reprieved, there's going to be other layers because of globalisation and the need and greed mm. for um, a rumour that is ours, and actually the way that they will only take small components or compounds out of that more. And so there's no magic left, eh? there's no modi, there's no wairua, which is what we're kaitiaki of and, um, on many levels. And you know, sometimes when we are asked to speak about these things, um, it, we're very passionate about it, but we also because I said before, and we've said before, we're rongoa, so the detrimental of what will happen to that arco is going to hit us in a way that can take a lot of people out. And there are kaitiaki of certain um, rāko around our mutu. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very, it's another form of genocide that mm -hmm. we're facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you think about layers and layers that we are coping with. And really, it's the strength of who we are and where we come from, now Papa, that has kept us here well, those of us who are well. And those of our um, whānau who had mamai in various areas of their lives. Ka aroha, eh? this is, has come upon them in layers. Yeah, I think that's what I want to say. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of touching on... Um, uh, Pāni is called it about being a kaitiaki in, in our community spaces, mm. um, particularly with regional and local council. So I'm going to kind of come back to that because I think that's another space um, that's just a byproduct of, of what happened to us back in 1907 with the Tohunga Suppression Act. So, so the voice of Rongoa has been suppressed. So let's be, let's be honest about this. 
since that act came into play, which basically criminalised tohunga, our experts, our um, tangata mōio, those ones who practised um, to protect and preserve and to, to keep our community safe. That's who our tohunga were and are. Um, that act, not only did it criminalise um, our ability to access them, um, to freely um, have them operating within our communities, what, it, what I believe it actually did is it actually over at least two generations, because it didn't get reprieved till 1962, mm. um, embedded a disbelief. Aye. And that's what I believe is what we are countering now. So there was a disbelief in that system, which was set up to keep us well, to keep us holistically well. And so part of our response um, in all the spaces we occupy, whether we're sitting with councils or whether we're sitting with ministries, whether we're sitting with our whānau, we've got this extra lot of work we have to do mm. to transform uh, the thinking and the beliefs within our, within our whakapapa. That's the, they hold that as a trauma. Because that's, and why I know that's still present is because they go to the doctor first. So that's how I know that belief is still present. Um, and I'm not saying we don't, you know, we totally work in a complementary way with the GPs and with the health system. But the fact that we often, at, at, at really certain is. times, we, we, we get called at the final hour when we should have been the first medicine they sought. Mm -hmm. And so there's disparity in the way in which we still view today. And so that comes through the contracts that are available to us, which limit our scope, tell us how to be, and define what rongoa is, what gives a Crown Agency that licence to do that. Um, we never ceded the sovereignty to them. Um, and, and you know, we're open to those conversations, that's the difference. I think we're open to any of these conversations. Whether we get invited is another thing. Um, but I want to have that conversation, is that um, I honour the origins of our whānau who have taken up um, the challenging role of being providers in our community. Okay, so I think about our iwi providers, I think about our Māori providers, mm. and I go, gee, they've endured some real big stuff over time. I, and I say that only because I was kind of there at the beginning of that. And so I've, I've got this longitudinal um, sight line of how those small, marae-based, quaint service um, providers were established where our kaumātu and kuia were right there, they were kind of hands-on inside of the development of, of provider services to our people. Um, and how, over time, um, sophisticated contracts have been kind of brought through and various kind of cycles of um, the health system have cycled through and kind of made uh, providers jump through hoops. So that's kind of what I want to say. Um, and so I wonder now whether we, we're ready to start to look at ourselves again. Because I don't, we know that hasn't worked. It's kind of removed us from the essence of how these, we started. And I wonder about that. We've become sophisticated providers, but actually when I look back and I remember back to the way it used to be, that had a heart, that had a, a strong modi, and the way to our connections with our relations who were visibly there was strong, and they weren't centred on 
this um, provision of services that's actually got a, got a Western foundation. So I, I want to challenge it, you know, because I kind of think, we are we having this conversation about beyond the contracts, beyond the stuff that we're getting um, paid to be, what, what might it look like if we redesigned this? And again, we've been through a cycle of unwellness these past three years, with lots of upheaval, lots of challenge, and I wonder what a new reality might look like if we kind of said, how might this be now if we got to choose how to redesign this? I, I, yeah, go. Well, you know, you, you, uh, the systemic um, reality is our people are unconscious to what Shah is saying, unconscious to what is around us in, in our um, environment. When I say unconscious, it just means that they're in the system that works, supposedly works for them, because it puts food on the table mm -hmm. and it pays the bills. And, and fair enough. Right. Yeah. But in, in that, there's this other stream that has constantly been there. And because of the, the weight, I'm going to use the word weight, because it is a weight, of how, you, um, how our people um, engage in a medical centre, um, mm. with any other health service, education, mm. yeah, and it's totally um, compelling. And so there's when when you the systemic thing is that that rumour voice is silenced or has been silenced, and then you have um, say a little rōpū over here or a big growing collective that's saying something else, and we may look scary because it's a truth that we are saying. And that can be challenging for our whānau. Because, you know, we are in this because we're in service mm. to our whānau, our community. But we are the complete opposite to what they're accustomed to over the years, yeah? And so um, that disbelief, I think you were, you are right, uh, over the years, because that's what, it's the hini number we have to actually um, engage with, you know, to shift that, that mindset. Um, because, you know, I see the unhappiness and unwellness um, of our people. I do honour all our Māori health workers yes. and the way that they, yes. they, you know, carry on. And I actually am always often, um, uh, what's the word, I feel for them. Or I'm, I'm sometimes scared for them because I can see, oh, you're not, you know, you've got a lot of yes. work to do because the system is asking you to do this much on this little bit of money or putia. So we see this constantly daily, the systemics um, dumbing down and silencing of Rungawa. And the, um, and I use the word unconscious because it is a consciousness that you wake up out of. Like our people are in a dream, mm. you know. And it's not it's a bit of a nightmare that dream, because you know, um, what we see is the symptoms of that with uh, addictions and gambling and um, abuse and violence. And we've all had this, you know, in our fauna, and we see this in our communities. And we've had interesting interventions that we have um, organised amongst ourselves, you know, that are fauna interventions. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say about that. <coughs> Sorry. I just wanted to bring up about during the COVID, mm. how Rungawa was kind of left out. Mm. And we had Fano, you know, reaching out for Rungawa. But, you know, we had the powers to be that had access to um, how they delivered, how they delivered um, resources um, during the COVID lockdown. So, like, we had Fano all over our rohe wanting Rongwa. Mm. And because Rongwa, it has its own modi and it made them feel safe mm. for uh, a, um, a, a, what was it, the pandemic or the, the, the unknown. Yeah, of the okay. unknown of the yeah. pandemic. Mm -hmm. The shadow. Yeah, the shadow. So that rumour 
also worked uh, wider with, with them because it gave them that safety net. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, Pani, because so, so there was the response to COVID. So this, this is just an example. We're, we're not kind of you know, using COVID as, as centre to what we want to promote, but it was it's a recent experience that's really good to kind of deconstruct this. So, you know, th there was um, a very strong health approach to... Um, to COVID, which didn't for a long time, and I say for a long time because we, we did eventually get there, but for a long, 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 long time there was only Western interventions offered to our whānau. And so part of the presence of systemic um, violations uh, to our people, which are continuous, is still still present in those strategies um, of offering support, manakitanga, um, aroha to our whānau. It still prevents us from um, expressing ourselves um, in a way that our people actually one want, because they do want that. Mm. Um, and. To, you know, we talk about no aspirations. We talk about it all. I, I have that conversation in lots of circles that I, I sit within. But we're actually not even listening to their aspirations and their desires because this was a request. And so we, what happened was we had to formulate our own response. Yeah. Unresourced, unsupported, because for us, Rungoa 101 is you just do the mahi, you serve. And so, you know, we, we took stats through that time of the number of whānau that we supported, and it was in the thousands. And so, you know, you can tick your, your boxes as much as you want, but this isn't going away. Um, and I think what's, what's occurred through that process for us is that as a collective we're stronger and we can mobilise faster. Mm. Just like the old people did. Mm. So what is the strength of a collective? So we could mobilise from Wataki to Wellington just like that. Um, and it wasn't through funded resources. It was through aroha ki te tangata. Manaki ki te tangata, which is actually what it is that we've been called to do. Kia ora, that's true.
you know, um, dealing with some, and I'll just, just from a practical yeah. thing, mm. dealing with some of our whānau who are in those areas, how they've been um, either been using meths, you know, and often a um, addiction will, will lead into other addictions mm. or are part of the whole. Mm whole group of them. And I think just because we live in Ōtaki, just because we have the resources of uh, our and the moana, it has been a, a place where I've gone and chucked people in. And, you know, it's an interesting kind of pūri because <laughs> just as an acute situation, because it shocks the actually in, in the atua, the awa, actually in the moana, tangaroa, it shocks people. And only then, once you come out of a pūre, and this is just from a, a, a clinician, uh, a practice, only then can we start the journey to wellness, if they so choose. Mm. Yeah. It's always about what's your choice. Mm. Yeah. Because, um, you know, our, a lot of our people aren't ready yet. Mm. Yeah. And so, um, after a pūre of that nature, you find out if they're ready. So that's just that for me. I think, um, you know, we have other rako umua that we may give out to our, our loved ones to help them to, mm. to calm the mind down, to um, ease the, um, the urges. Mm. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I wish somehow, and I think that's happening here in Ōtaki, that you know, there's, there's programs where you just take your whānau bush, mm. you know, and um, which is a powerful rongoa. Yeah. So, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I know that's from um, experience and practice mm. that I've had to do mm. over the years. Yeah? yeah. And, um, and, then you f- and then we then you decide as they, as people um, develop or as people move on, where they're going to be with their addiction. Because it, it always begins with you, with that person, where you want to be. Yeah. That's that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I think that's what we do do when we're working with Fano that have um, addictions or. Those kind of um, things going on for them. Like, yeah, we do take them out in the tayau and let them immerse themselves in the atua, um, which helps bring them back to balance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not their fault that these things are happening to them, it's, it's like the impact of colonisation. Um, we didn't have that kind of mamai back in the day. This is all new. Mm. And, you know, we're trying to navigate our way through reconnecting to who we are and, um, you know, and back in Te Ao Māori, the environment was... We were so connected to the environment, we were in tune with everything. And yeah, with that impact of colonisation and values changing, and um, we're, we're scrambling. And with the rongoa, it helps you get back into more of a balance inside and with the taiao and the atua. Mm. Mm. I kind of, um, in my experience of addiction and gambling and violence and abuse, because often those are all associated, um, it's just the symptom of the mamai that's the wound, right? The wound that sits in me. And over time, if you haven't had access to a pathway of healing that's worked, then it accumulates and it can um, create a trauma 
which activates, you know, that's the centre sometimes from which all your decisions are made. And so we talked before about the fact that the a access to kairungua, to tohunga, um, who would support and assist to clear the mamai, mm. because those haven't been readily available to whānau, then we've carried our mamai through generations and in actual fact handed it on just like we do with everything else heke iho, heke iho. Mm. and so part of um, the Romoa strategy to counter and transform this space also is about um, I look at it at the other spectrum so so how order from a how order approach might look at it from as it being a deficit and it is that's that's what it's been born from but when we go to heal it it's actually to transform it the other way so if we can start from a space of modi order and actually um, intrinsically um, support Fano to have um, moments and then days and then weeks and months and actually this is now your life filled with modi order then that's the transformative rumua that our people need not to be reminded that they've got an addiction not to be told that they actually um, can only get better if they have six psychologist sessions those help, those help, but actually I know what's in everybody's whakapapa, it's the same as what's in mine. And so when you got the basis of that as the, the base ingredient to well-being, and we talk about the space of potentiality, then, then um, I believe, and it's just my own personal belief, far no have it within them to um, create and to hold and to work on this pathway towards well-being themselves and and that's the long-lasting lifelong resilient pathway to being well not just now but forever so part of our rumoa strategy is about reminding our whānau it's that magic stuff of all of the magic that they've already got but actually these things have just occurred as a coping mechanism to the stuff that we've had to endure. And once they kind of realise they're in control, then yeah, there's potential for magic to, to happen. That's my belief. Oh, there's something else. Oh, yeah, you said yes. yes, well, I, was, <laughs> I agree with everything. We've, we've said here, Shah and Pania. And I'm just, I, you know, there's this belief, and I think it's because I, I saw the nannies do it. Mm. That little thing I said earlier where they would smile, where they would acknowledge that person, it's, a, it's their way of giving their heart felt wishes to them. Uh, especially those ones who are under some kind of trauma or stress. And so I was reminded of that um, recently, actually a, f a couple of months ago when my auntie passed away and one particular, um, you know, nephew, who's a bit of a mess and um, so I thought, oh, that truck, because you actually know what's inside, like Shah said, we know the potential and the magic they actually have inside. And I, I just grabbed him and said, boy, I will love you forever, mm -hmm. regardless of whatever you do in life know that your auntie will always love you. And he goes, true, I said, yeah, true. I've known you since you were a baby. You're a good person. And it's those particular things that we do and that a lot of people need to remind themselves to, be, to do with their, with their whānau, especially those ones who are struggling in addiction. You're always going to love them, regardless where they're going in their lives. That's got to be there. Because it's our way, our way, our way. Yeah, I, I'm kind of thinking a little bit about um, the importance of maramataka, so I'm um, just kind of going to go like that. I, 
I, I'm kind of thinking a little bit about um, the importance of maramataka. So um, just kind of going to go like that. But I, I find um, one of the reasons why why we have recently um, released Aromoa Maramataka is um, one to uh, reclaim the space of this being our norm. Like this was a, a tupuna practice. Um, this is a full system of personal self-management um, and it's also an ability that I'm kind of quoting Panya to predict the future and to um, plan forward. So one of the things that um, this particular maramataka does is that it, it draws from the old maramataka that, we, that, that was located here in Ōtaki. Um, looked after by our tūpuna. Um, and what it does is, what we've done is that we've taken the symbols, because that old maramataka was about kai, mahinga kai, um, of the fresh waters, the moana, and of marakai. And so we've kind of practiced those as a way of teaching ourselves again about maramataka and the centrality of it. But inside this, um, we've co-created a new set of symbols which look at um, mahi rongwa for the wai, so the kind of um, healing work you do with the waters, the healing work you do on the whenua and with the plants and growing, and then the healing work that you do with yourself as a tangata. One of the things that I think is really important on here is that he, this can be a, a self-management tool for whānau um, who may be challenged through their addictions um, to kind of go, when are the better days for us? And, and what might I plan for myself? Because often that's what happens is that we've taken ourselves out of our narrative and we're just kind of going through the motions. But what this makes us do is come, become, come really full and frontal to the, to the present moment and to look at the day that we're in, the lunar day that we're in, and then to kind of plan forward. And so there's a level of predictability in here that you can kind of use as a guide around your healing journey. And this isn't about a, a model of perfection, because that's not what maramataka is. It's about living inside your current um, circumstances and being fully present. And if there's one thing to counter what addiction does, which is to take us out of our present day living, this is a tool to bring us back to ourselves. So I just kind of wanted to bring it in as another way, like we're, we're always thinking, that's, and it's a trait of our confederation, mm -hmm. to constantly look at an innovative response um, to, to, to what's needed for our people. And it's always drawn from a traditional base, but it, it may just be um, delivered in a contemporary way. So um, it's how not to keep our mā tauranga locked in a box. It's how to actually um, open the box up and go, come on whānau, now, now, what, what, now what we got? Now what are we going to do? Thing was first thing that came from was <sighs> saying mm. brief. <laughs> I, I think um, well, it's, it's going to take us back to a lot of our um, um, our life words are just lost on me on our narratives. It takes us back to the the first breath, isn't it? Mm. The ha, yeah. And we and because the you know it's automatic. Breathing is automatic, like the heartbeat. If you don't breathe, well, you're dead. But you know, it's a constant, and, it's a breath, and it keeps us here in this realm, in the physical realm, so that we breathe. Because you know, sometimes it's the simplicity, the very simplicity that's right inside us and in front of us to connect back to yourself. It's, not, it's never out there. 
because remember you have all what is around you inside of you so it's got to start with the breath before even that you see mm. hey. and, and um, those um, pūkōrero that we have in our Amatauranga tells us and forms us this yeah. again it's that same kōrero that Shah's games was said before that it needs to, we need to bring it back bring that balance back but it starts simply mm. with that for me anyway mm. authentic self authentic oh yeah that's how I used to kind of have that conversation um, you know who is the O inside of your authentic self and um, I remember probably about I don't know two decades ago now I'm getting a little bit dated um, I remember having this conversation actually with, a, with, with, with Auntie Mi'i Pekka um, at Wehiwe and we had this whole conversation about we don't um, refer to kōwai o. we don't, that's not how you ask, you know, kōwai koe, it's no fair koe and we, I remember having that conversation with her but I was stuck on this, this question of kōwai o. And I just kind of couldn't leave it alone. Um, and so what I realised was I had to do some more thinking about that and some more exploration of why that wasn't leaving me. And the conversation kind of goes, Kōwai O. And it is that front end of my life, because I use my life as the, the pattern to, to, to explore. I was seeking out who's, from whose waters did I come? Whose waters am I swimming in? Um, you know, where have the why taken me um, over that kind of front end of my life? And so that was my explorative self. And, and I, I, you know, I had more questions than I had answers, to be honest. Um, and so it led me to different places which gave me a definite, yes, this is who I am, I feel great here. And it also led me to some spaces that said, Shit, I've got to get out of here. I oh, stop this behaviour. I'm not. Ha I need to not hang out with these people. Um, and so that call why question, call why O, oh, was really helpful while I was trying to work out who this authentic me was. Um, and so I I got to this point where um, I had I was no longer selling myself short of myself. And that's not a um, whakahihi thing. That was just the internal question I had. It's, my heart was asking me that. Who am I sharing breath with? Who will I share my, who, I, who will I share my breath with? Who's worthy of that? Mm. Um, and so I got to this point where I realised I'd kind of taken a whole lot of stuff out of my life and I'd added this huge amount of amazing content and people and experiences that I went ko waio ko tēnei this is me this is what I was destined to be here for this is what my tūpuna dream for me and so I don't I, I get I had to take that journey um, of the waters of the way um, to get to this point of my authentic self. Mm. Mm. That's lovely, Kori Ro. Um, yeah, and I kind of that sits here with me mm. because who are you, and mm. who, what is your intrinsic self, mm. and how does that portray out? And you know all those beautiful teachings that that our tupuna, our nannies have. Like instilled in us. Um, I know for me, it's been the nanny for my mokopuna mm. that can they can come to me and they know nans either in the garden making up some more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there too, Afi, your Fano and your people. Um, and I think a lot of that has been instilled in Papa 
because I knew I was on this road from a you know a young age, but not knowing, and um, yeah, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> The moi moi aforomua. We always come back to this question, actually, I, I, and I, I believe it's always present in our in our conversations because mm -hmm. we always find ourselves in spaces and places that rumua actually doesn't normally or isn't normally seen. Um, and again, because we've got our own ways of, of being inside of the space of the war, it just, we can naturally um, make it normal and make it centered to, to that space. And I'll give you an example. So, so we've been invited a couple of times now to um, offer some law events at Te Papa. Um, and so the Kaupapa are quite um, out here. And we've had to kind of go, okay, what would the Rungwa response be in this, in, in, in relation to this kaupapa? And so we've become quite innovative around how we might present Rungwa in that particular space. So we know Rungwa will always lead us um, to the right place and the right space and the right people at the right time. We just, we just trust in that innately. What um, in what form it turns up, in what form we offer it, um, often isn't known until we arrive into those spaces. But that's the transformative nature of Rongwa, right? So unfortunately, um, many people put it in a box, and 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 sometimes it does need to be put a to the side of people because there is a tapu nature of it but what often happens for us is that we can see beyond that and we make it accessible um, to our whanau in a way that's not going to create those issues for them so we offer it to them in a safe way um, in a magical way and in a way that makes sense for the time and the space so for us, the dream, the aspiration for Rungua, we never will know. As long as we flow, uh, follow the flow of Rungua and where Rungua guides us to go, we will be okay. And <coughs> as like Sha always says, um, like Rungua is our birthright mm. and you know, normalising our traditional practices is in a safe way um, is how I see it all moving forward. Mm. I, you know, when, when I think about moi moi ya, the, the thing is, when we get together, we cannot start stop ourselves from creating. It's like, oh no, we've just gone and created something else. <laughs> In, you know, in terms of rungoa and um, it, the way that the essence of rungoa takes over us and then we are creating. And so from, um, from one creation to the next, it just leads us into these places and then it's our duty and we find the way to anchor it into mm. this physical world. I, and the maramataka is an example of that. And the other examples of how we find ourselves in places like um, uh, Kiwi Park, yes. yeah. yeah, we find us, yeah, Fariro. We find ourselves there. We find ourselves working out. Oh yes, the um, Rongoa Bay for all our Rupu, where we're going to plant this Rongoa, um, you know, Marama, uh, where we're going to do these things, it's because they come out of just being together and then the room will go, ding, it's like that, ding, and we get this look on our faces, then we start discussing things. So the moimoya is always as 
Anya and Shanti, this is led by the Rumoa. This is led by our Rako. This is led by the Tupuna. And we're very happy to follow mm. And, mm. and put it into action as best we can. And I think that's the key, that, um, that Rumoa, you know, when you're thinking about if this is a pathway for you, um, as a kaitiaki, it's a place of servitude. Mm. And so, so you have to have a heart for service. Um, because it isn't a nine to five job. No. No, no. It's, <laughs> it's kind of a 24 7 role in your whanau, in your community, in the nation. And so you never know when you're going to get the call or a call. And you just have to respond. That's kind of what I want to say. That's the background to it. Nobody kind of really tells you that. That it's actually that's that those are the conditions of you agreeing to do this, May. Because you know sometimes we try and leave the whenua. Mm. So if we leave the whenua, then we get a break. But what happens is we leave the whenua, we get to the other, you know, country where we're going, and other things <laughs> of Rumwa presents itself. So um, you know it follows you across the globe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you always are prepared. We are prepared. I, I think that's the beautiful thing, is that you always are prepared for whatever comes forward. So you might not be on your whenua, and you might not have packed your full kite of whatever it is that you you take with you, but you can guarantee you've got everything you need. And that's the resourcefulness and the agility agility of um, being kaitakirungwa in the 21st century. Yeah is that um, we're not living in tribal societies where we're living next to each other. And so we have to be resourceful, we have to be agile, and we have to be innovative um, in the way in which we respond to the various needs of our whanau. Yeah. Mm. I always take a, a mini one more pack. We always, we do. always do. Yeah, you should check out your bags. Yeah. <laughs> And our in the boots of our okay. cars. <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah. Yeah. That's that, kind of the way. Oh, that'll get through custom, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in terms of the pathway to um, being a kaitiakirongwa, I think you've always either been on a pathway um, and things have usually popped up along the way and... You just have to kind of take stock, I think, in the first instance, of, of what's led you to making a decision about this. Because that then um, identifies which pathway you might pursue to um, learning more about it. So sometimes in an ideal world for us, you'd, you'd access it via your whakapapa. So if you've got those nannies, kōros, whānau members who do this mahi, that's the first ara, always. Mm. The most authentic ara that you could take. But not all of our whānau have that intact. Okay? So the next thing might be, who does it, or who does it in the area that you're living? So, so suss out who's local, who's around, um, who's in your neighbourhood, and make those connections. That's the second ara. Um, and then, you know, if there's, you know, that's not available to you, then yes, some kind of formal pathway of learning is another option. So going to, because it's currently only in tertiary providers, um, you can only kind of do it formally like that, through Tawana Ngoa Aotearoa or Tawana Ngoa Laukaua. But that's, again, you, you have to be ready for it. You have to be ready to step into that space because it requires you to be disciplined. Um, and the only reason why we say that is because what happens is you, you are immediately on a personal rongo journey. And sometimes it can hit people, sideswipe them. Because the truth of what needs to be healed inside of them comes up. And so it's not an external, oh yeah, I've got this tick certificate. What happens is the application becomes very real, full and frontal, um, and and usually you are, 
you are you are on that pathway of journey uh, of le of healing yourself. Yeah, and like I said before, like it's kind of the knowing, um, and it's not like oh I want to be this now. I've decided this. <laughs> I'm going to go study this. But mm. for me, it all was it's the knowing. It's always there. It's been there. You've been following that path without even realizing that you're that's you know you're doing that um, and there are other avenues you can go to but I think you should always seek out if you want to go down that path uh, mana whenua wherever you're living because they know the whenua they know they know that tikanga and the area you know, kia ora. You know this is a good question. Um, uh, you know, as we've been um, kayako, and I'm still kayako um, at um, Te Wānanga o Aotearoa for Rungoa Level 4. And what, one of the things that um, sometimes, you know, this may be the first step into mm. Rungoa. For a lot of our uh, Māori um, tauira, they realise that they have this tonga in their whānau and it's consolidating for them and mm -hmm. it's a good start for them. Mm -hmm. Like Pani said, to go home, mm -hmm. you need to, and often that's the message that comes from me, now you're here, now you know these things at this level, mm -hmm. now you need to go home. Mm -hmm. Go home and see those ones um, that you remember that you learned this from. Um, so, it, and some people get side, side white and that's okay, it's, it is a journey, but my concern has always been when we have um, tauiwi, when we have pākehā, people come into our courses, when we have, uh, you know, um, yeah, basically pākehā people. And um, so the way that I know that I teach or, or facilitate is that there's a key focus, a very strong focus on mana whenua, and there's a focus on being kaitiaki. There's a focus for our Pākehā Tawira. I said, your role really is to support. You are in there as support for, for um, Māori to have this tonga in, in their lives. And so I'm often sending them back to their herbalist um, mm. history and part of their mātauranga. So what's a, um, you know, we talk about mm. signature um, mūwa from where we come from. So if I've got someone from uh, Wales or Scotland, says, so what's the signature rumour back in your tupuna? Mm. And so one of the good things I think about that level four course is the first corner is about getting people to, um, you know, to understand their whakapapa, where they come from. So in institutions, I think it's a responsibility, it's a responsibility that we need to take on and to direct our non-Māori tauira to their whakapapa and to their mātauranga because they have it. And fortunately, because we know a lot of herbalists, because I've done this stuff, herbal, you know, looked at lots of wild plants, we, um, we know um, the mātauranga of those herbs, see, and we'll say, now this one originated here, are you from that area? Mm -hmm. Go, go mm -hmm. look at it. Mm -hmm. So that they're not always taking from our a whenua and, and our, our mātauranga basically and that you're giving back the strength of who they are so that's what I do with all um, Pākehā tauira you know when you've got tauira coming from other um, heritage like Indian or Chinese they've got this mm -hmm. wealth of uh, mm -hmm. you know of knowledge around healing and herbs and things and they're a great asset mm -hmm. to our um, mm -hmm. to our kaupapa and they get it. So I don't have to mm. emph emphasise that, but we need to be careful. Because, you know, there are some people that we look at who interview and we go, Tupuna, don't let them come through. And the Tupuna, don't let them come through. Because <laughs> we do, we think, oh no, because, you know, we see and we assess those things. So, yes, sometimes it's their first pathway. Mm. Yeah, but it, always, if you're not from this whenua, if you're not from this rupu, you go home or you speak to Mana Whenua about the wrong way here. 
I think what you've just said is really important, a moment, because in this um, whare wana of Rungwa, um, and it's no different than, than the other whare wana of, of things like whakairo, rāranga, you know, you, you're always kind of aiming to ensure that the succession will leave behind your masters, right? Because that's kind of the, the ultimate goal for all whānaha bodiwi, is that we will have masters to continue this legacy. Um, and so this is no different, and Rungwa is no different. And, and when we talk about um, the old schools, the old whariwānanga and those old processes, not everyone made it. Not everyone made it one through the front door, through the waharo, and not everyone made it through that kura. And so that's a little bit of a kind of a reminder for us about how we manage this in a in a modern 21st century um, approach to the, learning the moa, is that we still have um, by veto as being mana whenua, and upholding our own kawa and tikanga to say no. Because mm. mm. it's actually us that is, is mana whenua who protect and uphold the integrity of this. Um, so so I wouldn't go to Napuhi and tell Napuhi it'd be no way. Um, I respect how they would do it. I wouldn't go to Tuwhari to the same thing. When people come here, there is a way. And so um, it's our duty and obligation to the kaupapa to make sure that we have these kinds of checkpoints. Checkpoints. It's like uh, just recently with um, um, the Tawira from Te Wānawa Aotearoa, we, we took them to various places here in Ōtaki. You know, nice places. Then we took them to areas that are a bit handy as in, you know, oh, just walk past this uh, uri path and walking through them. And they liked us and said, listen, we're bringing you here to show you all around these areas you do not hauhaki. You see um, kawakawa all around these areas, you do not hauhaki here. And how do you know that? Because it's someone whose mana whenua is telling you. So we're giving you examples. You don't ever, if you're not from there, hauhaki anywhere. Because we know that um, people have done, and we have actually um, had punnies of various uh, mm. kawa kawa punnies, and like the dead, dead on arrival. It's like, where'd you get this from? <laughs> it's because as mana whenua, and because as rongwa people, <laughs> we know the motive. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some things, you know, you can't even blow a whistle around it because it's so um, dead. And that, that's been our experience. <laughs> yeah. And so it's a really strong um, uh, koiro that we put across to all Tawira. You know. And like, as, as I've lived in Auckland and lived in other areas, I would never, mm-hmm. never go out in Hauhaki, always talk to the, like, the Hokainga, you know, safety. And, and I, yeah. respect. Yeah, totally. Respect. And, and, and I think that's a baseline. Yeah. For Rongoa across the nation, mm. like this is the baseline, because um, there's you know there's other conversations going on about you know as a sector we need to that ensure that we're, we're we're protected and looked after and represented. Well, if these spaces, if these iwi spaces were honoured in the way they should be, and that people could work collectively like we are. I'm not saying this is the model, but it's a model. Naturally, this is the natural model, because it's whakapapa based. Then, then there's already a mechanism to protect the space up and to protect those coming through. Mm. Um, we don't need to create um, uh, something that's external to ourselves to, to provide a level of protection from home. We're already doing it at home. So so it's better to come and have these conversations. So if ministries want to set something up, come and talk to the Hokainga. Come and have these conversations rather than kind of creating a system, it's the systemic stuff again, that we are meant to follow. Come the other way. It's so much more efficient and you actually get 
authentic conversations happening. Yeah.